about today is what I'll call uh, locally biased eigenvectors, or if you're a machine learner, a name that might be more palatable, semi-supervised eigenvectors, but they'll essentially be the same thing. And the motivation here is, you know, there's a lot of problems where, you know, think latent semantic indexing, where you compute global eigenvectors. And the question is, um, what do those global eigenvectors tell you? And, and what if you can only compute so many and you want to get more fine-scaled information? How are you going to do that? And so one idea might be, you know, can I come up with some sort of local notion of eigenvectors, whatever that might mean? And it's not clear what that means because, I mean, eigenvectors really are very global quantities, right? You can only, if you have a nice matrix like a Laplacian or a correlation matrix, a symmetric matrix, you can fit n exactly orthogonal vectors or certainly no more than n exactly orthogonal vectors in the vector space. And so that's, you know, really limiting. And so people sometimes try and interpret the top eigenvectors and in some sense, by the time you, you know, the first eigenvector is probably a day of the week effect. So, you know, you peel off trivial things like that. And you ask, what's the interpretation of the tenth eigenvector? And, and the most obvious interpretation is that it's exactly perpendicular to the previous nine. Namely, any sort of little information you're trying to find in that is totally washed out by that exact global orthogonality requirement. So you can, can you get around that and look at some sort of localized notion. So, slightly more generally, say that you have data that's big in some sense of the word. So big can mean different things to different people. And actually, because of the, some of the implicit regularization effects that I'll get back to that you heard about earlier, big can actually mean fairly modestly big. But, you know, say that you have data that's big in some sense of the word, um, you know, one of these million or billion node graphs, and you want to analyze a small part of it. So a hundred node or a thousand node seed set, and you want to find a cluster around that seed node. So solution one, which is probably the more common one in practice, is take your big graph or matrix, whatever, and cut out a small part of it. Just throw out most of the stuff. And then use a traditional global algorithm. You have a small data set. You, know, you can do sort of global computations on it. And the challenge there is, you know, cutting out may be difficult to do a priori. You might be throwing out a little bit of signal that's going to be interesting. So there's a range of problems associated with that. So solution two that I'll be talking about is developed in some, sort of, in some sense locally biased methods uh, for data analysis. So localized eigenvectors, local diffusions, these sorts of things that maybe you have to only look at a small part of a large data set. And the challenge here, to oversimplify, is that you know, most data analysis and machine learning tools, either implicitly or explicitly, make very sort of strong local global assumptions. So what do you mean by this? So you know, spectral partitioning will work on anything it gi you give it, but sort of what it wants, you know, what it's, where it's sort of the right thing to do, is when you're going to have nice, well-balanced clusters, 50-50 clusters in some sort of sense. Recursive partitioning, you know, what you hope is that you split the data set into two well-balanced pieces so that your recursion depth's not too big, right? If you have a billion node graph and you're nibbling off 10 edges at every level of recursion, that's going to be a fairly deep, you know, level of recursion. Eigenvectors optimize some global objective. So the challenge here is that most tools, in many cases implicitly, uh, will make these very strong local global assumptions. So can we get around that? So what do we mean by sort of locally biased methods and locally biased problems? So one, you might have a big graph, you heard about this, and you want to um, find you know, some, some small or, or, or some large number of, of small clusters or communities in it. Um, locally biased image segmentation. I mean, imagine you have a big picture, so think computer vision, and in the middle of it you have a tiger wandering around. And the question is, can you find that tiger with, with global eigenvector and normalized cuts and sort of methods that you use in computer vision? And of course the answer is no way, because the first thing your, your algorithm is going to do is cut off the sky, because that's maybe, maybe only half the sky. That's the first thing that most of these algorithms will cut off. And then you'll peel off and get the second and the third. And by the time you get down to the 10th level of recursion, you've cut the tiger up into 10 pieces. So is there some way that if there's a tiger sitting in the middle of the figure, you know, you can try and pull that out? You know, local, you know, brain image analysis. You put a subject in a scanner and uh, you tickle this part of the brain with light or music or something and you want to know whether this part lights up. And there's a lot of neurons going, a lot of stuff going on. Can you focus really on those certain uh, parts of the brain where uh, you're, you're going to get some temporal correlations that's, you know, hopefully you can back out something causal going on. And we're talking here basically about partitioning, but the isoparametric control that you, you get from that basically gives you good statistical properties and good inf inferential properties. So you might want to do some sort of locally biased inference. So, you know, you start around the cluster, make some prediction about should a node be in the cluster, and in a sense, you know, what's going on on the other side of the world shouldn't make a great deal of difference about the quality of that prediction. So global spectrum methods. So we, we'll be talking about locally biased eigenvectors. So you'll be got the, the obvious thing to compare to is global eigenvectors. So spectral methods, eigenvector-based methods, are good for a lot of things. So say you have a road network of the US. You can, well, a not a typical thing to do is to construct some sort of graph from the data. There's a lot of details in how to do that properly, but let me not get into that. And then basically you compute the second eigenvalue exactly or approximately. You heard yesterday Yanis saying that 
you can, you can get away with approximate eigenvectors and a lot of the sort of quality of approximation guarantees go through. So get an exact or approximate second eigenvector and then do a bunch of stuff with it. And the, you know, if you're looking at the road network, you cut down the Mississippi. So you cut into the left half and right half. So that's good. And so why is this useful? Um, there's strong connections here with random walks, diffusions, these sorts of things, sparse cuts. The isoparametric structure gives you strong control and capacity or inference. And it's relatively easy to compute. I mean, if you're talking about 100 billion node graphs, it's going to make you sweat. But certainly, if you're anything reasonable size, it's relatively easy to compute, say, compared to the intractable you know, graph partitioning problem this thing approximates. On the other hand, it does not work well for a range of things. So say, instead of wanting to partition the whole US up, you have the tiger in the middle of the image. Or you have a little piece going on down here. You want to try and partition this. And what I give you is the full graph. Now, of course, one thing to do is to cut that off and then use a global eigenvector method. But there's situations where you don't want to do that, where you want to try and pull that off given the full data set, and, and maybe not even looking at the full data set. So the leading eigenvector is useful for a lot of things, but really it's inherently global, and in particular, it may not be sensitive to very, very local information. So there's a lot of sparse cuts, meaning you know, good clusters, that might be very poorly correlated with the second eigenvector, or for that matter, with all of them. Um, interesting local regions may be hidden from these global eigenvectors and essentially dominated by that exact orthogonality constraint. So the question here is going to be, can we find some sort of locally biased analog of the usual global eigenvectors that are going to come with all the good properties of the global eigenvectors, all or, or most of the good properties? So you know, connections with random walks and sparse cuts, nice inferential properties, easy to compute, let's say. So that's what I'll be talking about. And an outline is going to be the following. So I'll give you a construction for a way to do this. I don't know that it's unique, but it's a way, it's sort of an onset, it's an optimization perspective. So there's going to be two perspectives here. One is as an optimization thing, what are you actually computing? The other is how are you going to actually compute it? You run an algorithm. And when you can't compute something exactly, you might say I'm going to run this approximation procedure. But of course then the question is, you know, what does this approximation procedure approximate? Hopefully it approximates this thing. And then you can say, well, what does this approximation procedure exactly optimize? And it might optimize a regularized or perturbed version of this thing. And you heard a couple examples of this uh, earlier, and we'll get back into this. So what's going to be going on here is we're going to be talking about optimization problems. And sometimes these approximation algorithms for these optimization problems do much better than you'd expect. And why is that? And the answer is something called implicit regularization. So it's not that you have an objective and you tack on a regularization term, but the approximation algorithm that approximates that objective in addition, exactly optimizes a regularized version of something else. So that's why these algorithms might be useful if you're thinking of billion node graphs, but even if you're talking about 100,000 node graphs that are large in a very modest sense of the word large, this implicit regularization can help you there. So I'll, I'll give you an example of that. And then I'll talk about the extensions of this locally biased eigenvector to compute a bunch of locally biased eigenvectors. Um, there's some technical difference between the first one and the, and, and, and the subsequent 10. Uh, and I'll point you to some problems that are solved and some open problems. And there's going to be some interesting questions if you really want to scale up having to do with implicit regularization of a slightly different form and how you'd want to actually scale these things up. So that's sort of the outline. So let's recall the usual spectral graph partitioning. So this is what you saw, I guess, yesterday and earlier today. Um, if you're familiar with this area, you'll know what these letters mean. If not, I'll just... Uh, give you a rough, rough idea of what's going on and gloss over some of the other details. But L is, is, let's call it a Laplacian. This is your graph. A Laplacian is a matrix that represents the graph. And the usual way, if you want to uh, do spectral partitioning or spectral clustering of some sort, is to optimize the following problem, X transpose LX. So this is like a Rayleigh quotient. It's a quadratic form, subject to the constraint that your uh, x vector is unit length, and you're perpendicular to the all ones vector. This is a degree weighted all ones vector, the trivial eigenvector, sometimes it's called. So you want to optimize this quadratic form. So this is, why is this useful? It's not obvious that it's useful for anything. It turns out it is. It's a relaxation of this thing. This is the uh, conductance or expansion, the sparsest cut problem. That's intractable to compute. This thing will compute an approximation to that in the following sense. Um, and in addition, it's solvable via an eigenvalue problem. So you don't have to enumerate or solve any, any, any NP-hard problems. You can solve an eigenvalue problem, either exactly or approximately. And the quality you get is if you take this eigenvector and sweep o over it, do the rank order sweeping that David was mentioning, then you get a number, call it lambda 2, that is close to phi, the intractable thing to compute. So this is Cheeger's inequality. There's an easy direction and a hard direction, but this is Cheeger's inequality if you do that sweep cut. So you know, you're good in this clustering metric, and you get the associated inference and other properties that are nice with that. So when we're talking about uh, 
localization, what we want to have here is sort of a geometric notion. So, so we're trying to merge some of these spectral graph theoretic ideas with linear algebraic ideas. And so let's talk from the optimization perspective. We'll get to the algorithmic perspective in a second. But from the optimization perspective, let's talk about a geometric notion of correlation between partitions or cuts between sets of nodes. But really, it's going to be between vectors. So given a cut t, meaning a cut is just a set of nodes, it's a partition, let's define a vector s sub t. This is essentially an indicator vector for that partition. Since we need to stay off the degree weighted all ones vector, the trivial eigenvector takes a slightly more complicated form. But think of this as an indicator vector. And in particular, if you have a small cut, this has most of its mass localized in a small number of entries. So that's a geometric notion of correlation. It's, it's good or bad. We'll get to whether it makes sense in a second, but it's, it's a notion. And given this, you can define a geometric notion of correlation between all sorts of things, and it, it sort of corresponds to what you'd intuitively expect. So the second thing you need is a following definition. I'll call this a definition. So given a graph G and a number, let's say that number goes between negative infinity and positive lambda 2, the second eigenvalue. And let's say you're given a seed vector S. And for simplicity, think of it as localized in a small number of nodes, but it could be anything. Then I'll call it a GPPR, a generalized personalized page rank vector, is any vector of the following form. Laplacian of the, complete, Laplacian of the graph minus alpha Laplacian of the complete graph, pseudo-inverse, times your degree-weighted seed vector. So it's not obvious, but this is just page rank, just the usual thing, generalized slightly. So in particular, the usual story, is you, as David told you, with page rank is you have a drunken walker. He takes a diffusion around a graph. He teleports either to all the nodes or back to the seed set. All right? And you have a parameter that says you teleport with probability some fraction between 0 and 1. That fraction 0 to 1 maps exactly negative infinity to 0. So if you view this as a linear equation, then you can sort of access a slightly larger parameter regime. And we'll see later, this is a regularization parameter. It's not usually described as such, but it's a regularization parameter. And so if you just formulate this thing as a linear equation, which it is, you can access a slightly larger parameter regime. So think of this as one of two ways. This is just page rank with diffusions, but if you formulate it this way, you can access a slightly larger parameter regime. This detail matters because we're going to be doing something local. We're going to enforce an orthogonality constraint, and it's going to make a big difference if we're asking for exact orthogonality, which is a very global criteria, or approximate orthogonality. So local spectral partitioning. So here's an ansatz. I'm just giving this to you. It's not obvious this is good. I'll give it to you and then say why it is. But here's an ansatz. Let's optimize x transpose LX, the thing we had before, subject to the usual constraints, you know, your unit length and so on, and subject to the constraint that x dotted to the seed vector squared is greater than kappa. So I give you a graph. I give you a seed node. And I give you a correlation parameter kappa. And I say, don't optimize the Rayleigh quotient, but optimize the Rayleigh quotient subject to this geometric constraint, that you have to be well correlated with the seed set. That's an equality, because you'll saturate it. Interpretation. So what I said before is you, you compute the spectral method, and that gives you an approximation of the intractable conductance problem. The Cheeger inequality gives you the, the, that you find a cut that's close to the best global one. So interpretation. This finds a cut that's well correlated with the seed vector s. And if s is a signal, single node, this program relaxes the following, min over all subsets S, where the seed vector is contained in S, and the cardinality of S is less than 1 over kappa, that quantity. So a locally biased notion of conductance. So not, don't ask the global conductance. Ask this locally biased notion of conductance. This program relaxes that. Now, this program is non-convex. There's no reason to think it's nice, but this program relaxes that. There's a dual interpretation that I'm not going to get into. So we want this program to be good in all the senses that the global one's good. So here's one sense in which it's good. If x star is a solution to this thing, then it has the form of a generalized personalized page rank vector for some appropriate value of a parameter that you can get with binary search. All right? If x star optimizes this thing, then you can find it with a linear equation. And that's fast in a moderately strong sense of the word. So the proof of this isn't immediately obvious. Um, basically, we had to relax this non-convex problem lift it to an SDP, that SDP had strong duality. From the strong duality, you could show from complementary slackness that the solution was rank one, meaning it's a vector. And it's a vector of that particular form. So you can compute it fast. Are you computing anything worthwhile? Right? You can compute things that aren't worth anything very quickly. So is this thing good for anything? So Chico's inequality gives you an upper bound and a lower bound. 
the details of the parameterization are slightly more complex, so let me not go into that. But basically, theorem, upper bound, as usual, take the vector you compute, do a sweep cut, you get an upper bound, the usual Cheeger guarantee, and you're going to get a lower bound, not just on what you see, but on any cuts nearby. So basically, for all sets of node t that are reasonably well correlated with what you're looking for, this is going to provide a lower bound. So you have an upper bound and a lower bound, so exactly analogous. So sort of what's informally going on here? So I described it as an optimization problem. Depending on how you choose the parameter, you have a grayscale here going red to yellow and so on. And you can find sort of a local cluster here. If you choose the parameters a little bit differently, you'll find this cut, you'll find this cut, you'll find that cut. Similarly here, you'll find this cut or this cut or that cut. Now what you might want to do is say, geez, I want to find a cluster of size 50, or I want to find a cluster of size 487. So that's not going to be something that's algorithmically achievable easily. What you can do is formulate it this way. That has a plus side that you can solve it. It has a minus side that sometimes you get these plateaus. If you look at volume as a function of the conductance value, or conductance as a function of the volume, sorry, you're going to get these plateaus. And if you start at a more central node, it's going to behave one way. And if you start at a more peripheral node, things are going to get jumping in a little, you know, a little bit um, more plateaus. And certain regions are just going to be hard to find, basically because once you get out of that bottleneck, you touch the whole bunch of the other graph. And as you get a you know, million node graphs, you're going to quickly touch high degree nodes, and things are going to get a little bit messy. Um, <clears throat> and so here's your tiger. So you have the tiger in the middle, and you're not going to be able to find this with global eigenvectors, but if you construct a graph with this, plug into the usual computer vision pipeline. If you have one seed node at the head, you can find that. If you have a few seed nodes over the body, the leading few semi-supervised eigenvectors will be able to find this in, in you know, standard computer vision pipeline. All right? So let me talk about sort of the implicit regularization aspect of this, because I talked about computing the solving a linear equation. I said you, there's some relationship to running a diffusion. So what's, the, what's going to be the connection between these two? So a connection between these two will be the following. So the usual characterization of the personalized page rank is you know, that you have some um, stationary distribution. That's the stationary distribution of a random walk. Equivalently, it's a linear mapping. And this is just a bunch of letters to, to say this is the linear mapping from the input to the output, because this is a linear operation. It's a linear algorithm. And comparing with our definition of personalized page rank vector, I wrote it in, in sort of a very different way. So the question might be, can you characterize or formalize the sense in which the page rank, namely this thing you compute or that thing you compute, is a regularized version of the uh, leading non-trivial eigenvector of the Laplacian? And the reason here is that we're talking about locally biased eigenvectors, but if you choose the parameters the right way and let that alpha, that alpha parameter not be negative but go all the way to lambda 2, you in fact get the global eigenvector and you can iteratively peel that thing. So can you formalize the idea that in some sense page rank is a regularized version? So here's what we had before, x transpose LX, and the way machine learners and data analysts like to uh, implement regularization is to say, take your objective and tack on lambda times a regularization function and then call a black box. So in this particular case, another formulation of the objectives of interest, you can optimize instead of x transpose LX, where x is a vector, you can optimize L dotted into capital X, namely a matrix trace, a dot product where, the, where capital X is a matrix, a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. You can generalize the usual constraints. And you can do the same thing. You can tack regularization on here, objective plus lambda times a regularization. So theorem, this is uh, Lorenzo Recchia came up with this. Let's call this an F A to SDP. It's a semi-definite program where you're optimizing L dot trace of L dot X plus lambda regularization parameter times a regularization function, f, that's arbitrary at this point. Theorem, let g be your graph with Laplacian L, then the following conditions are going to be sufficient for x star to be an optimal solution to that thing. If x star has, satisfies these two things, which don't worry about, and if x star takes this particular form. So if you've never seen this form before, it looks sort of ugly. If you do convex optimization, it's sort of a natural thing. It's a natural thing because it's, it's good for a bunch of properties, and in particular something I'll put up on the next slide. But basically I'm saying that if x star takes that form, then you've solved this regularized SDP, meaning a regularized version of this thing, meaning a regularized version of the spectral partitioning algorithm. So proof, write down the KKT conditions and jump through a few lines, but very easy. Corollary. If f takes this particular form, a log determinant of a matrix, then plug it into that expression, and the log determinant's a particularly nice thing we take the derivative and the inverse of, so plug into that expression. If f is a log determinant, then you get the scaled page rank matrix, meaning you get that as your solution. 
meaning that we're running page rank with some value of the teleportation parameter, the drunken walker parameter, and what you're solving is exactly that, this regularized SDP, Laplacian dotted into capital X with that regularization term. And you're not calling a regularized SDP solver, you're running three steps of a power method or a drunken page rank walk with some value of the teleportation parameter. So page rank here is doing two things. One, it approximately computes the Fiedler vector, the second eigenvector. Two, it exactly computes a regularized version of that eigenvector, implicitly because you're just running three steps of your drunken walker. And similarly, if, if you think of other sorts of things with generalized, um, not log determinant, but generalized entropy or certain matrix P norms, you're implicitly uh, heat kernel computations, um, iterative procedures like uh, power methods, um, other things like that implicitly solve regularized problems. So in a bunch of these cases, a bunch of variants of diffusion-based algorithms exactly solve regularized versions of the problems you're hoping to approximate. So that actually will explain why, one, they're useful um, as you get larger, because that's sort of a, you're, you're going to be fast, but two, even if you don't get obscenely large with the algorithmic running time is not the bottleneck, sometimes the algorithms are, are better than you'd expect, and they're better than you expect because of these sorts of implicit regularization questions. So I'm going to go through the last two sections sort of quickly. This is going to say basically, I've told you how to compute the leading eigenvector. What if you want 10 of them? Because machine learners like you know, the top 10 eigenvectors to do kernel methods. The short answer is yes, you can do that. The next thing is, what if you want all 10 to be strongly localized in the sense you just heard about? So we can make the leading one strongly localized, and I'll m mention that briefly, but this is related to actually what David was talking about um, with the implicitly uh, regularized L1 um, implicit regularization on the L2 objective. We can do that with the leading uh, eigenvector. There's this diffusion interpretation uses the per push algorithm, open problem, do that with all 10. Do that with the leading 10 eigenvectors or any of a range of other things um, that the diffusion-based machine learning uh, people do. So semi-supervised eigenvectors. Um, I don't know if you can see that in the back, but it looks fuzzy from the front, so maybe you can't see it in the back either. So the usual I global objective is what I had down. This is what I had up a few slides ago. And, and the extension will, in this case, be sort of the obvious thing. Optimize X transpose LX subject to a locality constraint and subject to the constraint that you're orthogonal to the previously computed eigenvectors. Now, there's, the rub here is that you're going to be exactly orthogonal in a global sense. It's not obvious that's the most appropriate sense if you want to make these things strongly local, but there's, but there's going to be a trade-off between, um, it's in essence, the regularization parameter and the number of eigenvectors you can get. So basically, if you want to get 10 eigenvectors, you can do that with a bunch of linear equations. They're going to be localized in the sense that they'll be correlated with that correlation notion I had up before. They'll be correlated with the seed, but the extent to which they're localized, meaning most of the masses around the seed set, gets weaker and weaker as you compute 10. So when I said open problem, you know, get 10 eigenvectors that are, uh, get, that are localized in the sense that most of their mass is around the seed node. Now that's probably too much to hope for, but maybe you can get eight or nine of them. Because if you make this thing strongly localized, you're sort of violating this Euclidean space property, right? You know, you're not taking advantage of the global orthogonality, so you're truncating a little bit. You're going to be throwing away a bit of, 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 of locality parameter, if you will. You're going to be regularizing slightly more heavily. So get, instead of 10, get 9 or 8 of them. So that's, that's the more precise version. So um, the idea, I don't know, I hope these are visual. The idea is that, you know, you get... In, in at least a nice case, you have a ring, you get the usual you know, Fourier modes, this, the slow mode, second eigenvector, third eigenvector, slightly higher frequency. How robust is that to realistic heterogeneities and data? And the answer is not at all. If you throw a few random edges in there, you totally mess that up completely. So if, if the data is obscenely nice and manifolds and curvatures and so on, it's fine. But if you have any realistic heterogeneities, that gets messed up very quickly. You go to localized eigenvectors if you have the seed node at 12 o'clock. I don't know how good uh, the lighting is in particular the yellow, but the, you know, the Fourier modes, you get local analogs. So the first one has some, uh, some frequency. The second one has a slightly higher frequency. If you make the locality parameter medium, then you might informally, if you think of this as a diffusion, bleed some mass out from here to some other place here where there happens to be an artifactual edge. If you make the locality parameter a little bit more strong, you bias yourself much more locally still. So you can apply this to a bunch of things. If you like toy data, you can think of digits, and you can say, is it easy to separate fours and nines? 
and, and that's a relatively hard problem, and is, is it ones and sevens might be sort of close, but you know, sixes and ones are, are two digits that are pretty far apart. You'd get these things you'd expect in terms of precision recall curves in that way. If you like medical applications, you can apply this to fMRI brain imaging. Um, the state of the art there was something called searchlight. Um, Essentially what they did is cut out a piece of the brain. I guess I shouldn't say literally cut out a piece of the brain. That's what doctors did, physicians did, you know, 50 or 100 years ago. Now they'll put you in a medical, in, in, in a scanner and get a nice high resolution MRI and cut out a piece of the image of the brain and do global eigenvectors. They'd do sparse plus low rank, you know, any of the usual things they'd do on that. So the question is, can you take the full image, not knowing that you want to look at this part of the brain versus that part of the brain and do some sort of semi-supervised eigenvectors? Do I have that there? No. The short answer is that you can do that. And you see a bunch of trade-offs having to do with these regularization parameters and how much you get uh, in there. So let me not go into the details of that. Let me just put this up as sort of an ad way of advertising for David Lala. He's going to have a poster tomorrow. In astronomy, you might want to ask the question, I look, put my uh, telescope up in the sky and I get a bunch of images. Each image is 4,096 pixels by 100 million images construct a graph from the 100 million images, that, you know, which stars are close to what. And, and so you want to run various classification algorithms. And essentially what they want to do there is there's a bunch of common types of galaxies you see and you're looking for outliers and other interesting things to you know, discover new types of quasars or new, new sorts of galactic evolution modes. So, you know, you get red galaxies that behave one way, blue galaxies that behave another. And I think we've got this color coding right, so red's here, blue's here. This is a particular embedding. And you can get global eigenvectors and you get an ROC curve that looks like this, which is good. If you want to get you know, red versus blue, you do one sort of thing. If you want to zoom in very locally on, let's say, this particular part of the graph, which has interesting properties for astronomers, now using a little bit more information, right? So it's not just the, data, the original data points, using a little bit of semi-supervised information. The astronomer has to say these are pixels that correspond to this galaxy and those are not. If you use that information, you can pull the ROC curves way over and do a much better job. So David can give you more details on that tomorrow. And so let me wrap up just by, so I, I should have correlated with, or coordinated with David a little bit better. The last couple slides I had uh, were actually some of the ones he had too. So the question is, I have a 100 million node graph, I don't want to be running these diffusions, so I want to use a push algorithm. I can do that to compute the first eigenvectors. The question I asked you is, can you do that to get the first 10, and if not, at least eight of the first 10? But even if you're working on a graph with 100,000 nodes, what we saw in a bunch of applications is that the push method actually did remarkably well, I mean surprisingly well. And the question is why, and there's a bunch of other related methods that do something push-like and get similar theory. Pull out a cluster, you know, the running time depends on the size of the localization, not the size of the graph, and they did much worse. And so the question was why. So David walked you through this construction. So two types of theorems you might want to push about, approve about the first method. Theorem one is the anderson chung lang result. The ACL push procedure returns a vector that's epsilon worse than the exact PPR, but is much faster to compute. The usual form of guarantee you'd get in approximation algorithms. I'm a, little bit, uh, I'm a little bit worse, but I'm much faster. And that's true. But in addition, the ACL push procedure returns a vector that exactly solves an L1 regularized version of the original objective. And so David walked you through the construction relating to min cuts. And so if you have a two norm, this is the edge incidence matrix, minimize, so it's a, it's a tall matrix, minimize the two norm of this sort of thing, changing from L1 to L2 relates the min cut to the electrical flow, but minimize the Euclidean norm of this thing, that's the page rank solution. So when you run page rank with the drunken walker, this is a different thing you're optimizing, and you're optimizing this exactly in addition to the thing I told you about before. You're optimizing this exactly. And when you run the push procedure, which purports, and it, it does in fact approximate that personalized page rank vector, you take this objective, and I should have lined them up so it was more clear, but that becomes exactly that, and you tack on this. And if you know about optimization and, and these sorts of things, if two doesn't give you what you want, you go to one. So you put, an, put a one there, and there's endless, endless work done on L1 of, of a million different forms. Um, that's good or bad, depending on more on your biases and your backgrounds than on the data or the algorithms. But what we're doing here is implicitly doing an L1. Namely, we're running a diffusion. We're informally truncating certain things to zero, but as you saw, the push procedure maintains two vectors such that a global invariant is maintained, and you only have to touch localized bits of information. 
and that's what you're optimizing exactly. Namely, you're exactly optimizing a sparsity regularized version of L2. So with that, let me wrap up. So two things. One, you have a big data set, cut a bunch of things out, run usual global methods. A lot of people do that, that's fine. You might have the large data set and you want to um, do sort of a locally biased machine learning or locally biased data analysis. So I haven't talked about very large scale implementations. David mentioned that the push method has been, we've implemented it on graphs with uh, tens of millions of nodes. So, you know, large but not obscenely large. He and others have implemented on graphs with billions of edges. So, you know, large enough that it's, it's, it's reasonably large. But even on graphs with 100,000 nodes, it actually does remarkably well. So what we've described is a bunch of ways to do locally biased or, or semi-supervised machine learning. Locally biased using of the global eigenvectors that come with a bunch of analogs, usually marginally weaker because of local global issues, but very similar to the way in which the uh, global methods are good. Strong algorithmic results. Running time uh, typically doesn't depend on the size of the graph, depends on the size of the local cluster you're looking for. But in addition, very strong algorithmic uh, statistical guarantees. Namely, you're getting sparsity-induced regularized versions of what you want. Um, lots of nice results in a bunch of applications. And really interesting questions between sort of approximation algorithms, the theory of approximation algorithms that says, I'm running this thing fast on the data set in front of me and I'm marginally worse. And what the way machine learners and statisticians usually think about this, where they want to go beyond the data at hand and make inferential claims. And as I said, lots of special case studies where we start to scale up to data sets with a large, with a capital L. So with that, let me uh, wrap up and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Question is, sometimes you might want to, a different, stra well, a seemingly different strategy could be enforce locality of the weighted inner product. So that would come on the optimization side. Separate question, how can you algorithmically find it maybe quickly and so on. That's not so different to what's being actually done. So, so we're giving the, uh, the localization on this vector. If you interpret what the spectral partitioning algorithm is doing in the dual, the thing I glossed over, one way to think about spectral partitioning in the dual is that it's sort of embedding you in a complete graph. And it's not immediately obvious, but the degree weighted all ones vector, if you think of what is the Laplacian of a complete, what's the identity? The identity you think of as a diagonal matrix, but if you ask yourself, forget about degree weights, say it's a degree homogeneous. If you ask yourself, what does the identity look like if you stay off the trivial eigenvector, the all ones vector. And it looks like a diagonal matrix minus one over n one one transpose. So it's, it's the Laplacian of a complete graph. So as long as you promise me that you're gonna stay off the trivial eigenspace, the identity is a Laplacian of a complete graph. So that's sort of why the spectral methods embed you in, in a complete graph essentially. So the local analogs of that embed you in a, in a locally biased and, and degree weighted analog of that complete graph. So that's, that's one way to implement what you're saying. So this is sort of going on under the hood. You could probably do it more generally, actually. And, and I, I, I don't know that, but you can probably do it more generally. Okay, the eigenvalues would change also, I think. So also saying, so, so a different variant of that in the extension to the getting 10 eigenvectors, it's better to view it as a, as a constrained eigenvalue problem, um, which gives you the optim, a different optimization characterization, doesn't tell you how to implement it, but, but you might be able to get the better implementation with push by taking advantage of that. And, but, but so you can think of that as a constrained eigenvalue problem, yeah.